So imagine this scenario. A fugitive is on the run, but the police are all around. The fugitive is running out of options as the cops are closing in. And then suddenly, it happens. A distraction or a disturbance, something shocking that upends the whole situation. And in the ensuing chaos, our fugitive manages to escape to freedom. Ecologists wonder, are some species like fugitives on the run? So we recently talked about the competitive exclusion principle, the idea that species can't coexist if they have the same limiting resource. But in nature, species often do have similar resource requirements. For example, many species of plankton seem to subsist on very few limiting nutrients. Similarly, many plants, trees, and grasses coexist, despite the fact that many are nitrogen limited. And that really begs the question, how is it that these species get around the competitive exclusion principle? What is it that they're doing? Why don't the superior competitor or competitors drive the inferior ones to extinction? How do they coexist? As it turns out, there is absolutely no shortage of proposed coexistence mechanisms. In fact, quite the other way around, I would say that the existential terror of studying theoretical ecology is making sense of the overwhelming number of proposed ideas. That's to say that ecologists are still figuring things out. And that's what makes ecology so exciting. It's young and a bit underdeveloped, but it's also what makes it a bit difficult to teach. So instead of going through some kind of formal introduction or something like that, I'm just going to talk about some of the more influential ideas, ideas that I think are important or interesting or amusing, just important to me in some way. I'm a bit biased, so you're stuck with what I think is important. And today we're going to talk about one of my personal favorite ideas, which starts with the question, are some species fugitives on the run? I find it makes for a really fun mental image because it's usually applied to plants, but what? Do ecologists think that some plants sprout legs and run away? Well, not quite. Let's try to understand this with an example. So our example today comes from a classic study that was conducted on the shores of Elwood Beach in Santa Barbara, which has absolutely nothing in common with Lake Michigan here, but we're dealing with the props that we have, so we'll just roll with it. We'll focus on two types of algae that live on the surfaces of boulders on the rocky intertidal zone. We have green algae and we have red algae, and they compete over the available space on boulders. As a quick side note, I found some green algae here today, no red algae that I could find, so uh, we'll have to imagine the competition, but uh, maybe if we go to California, we would find something. The red algae are superior competitors, and that makes them our conceptual police officers. What'll happen is if they end up on the same boulder as green algae, which are our conceptual fugitives, the red algae will bully the green algae, it'll outcompete them and drive them to extinction locally on that boulder. Only the red algae remain on the equilibrium or final state of the boulder. If you're a fugitive, you probably can't fight off the police, but maybe, just maybe, you can outrun them. And that, in essence, is the green algae's strategy. It's the superior colonizer, so it more efficiently disperses spores throughout the water and allows it to establish more rapidly on boulders than the red algae. We call this kind of asymmetry between the green and red algae a competition colonization trade-off. Importantly, there are many, many boulders in the intertidal zone. So it's here in this maze of boulders that our green algae, our fugitive, will continually be making its daring escapes. The competition colonization trade-off centers around the idea of thinking individual boulders like patches that both of the algae can potentially occupy. The idea is that once in a while, a powerful wave will come along, overturning a boulder and killing the algae on top of it. And importantly, this exposes an empty patch, an empty side, an empty surface of the boulder that is, in essence, newly available real estate. This open patch provides the perfect opportunity for our green algae, the fugitive, to rapidly come in and colonize the boulder. Now let's think about a whole beach. From this, we can get a picture of how the competition colonization trade-off works. And for some additional inspiration, let's look at some real-life boulders. Some boulders are small, and I can flip them easily. Others are huge, and I can't move them at all. 
And some boulders are intermediate. I can only move them if I put in some serious effort. The same struggles I face when trying to overturn a boulder are also true for waves. A strong enough wave can overturn any boulder, large or small. An intermediate sized wave can overturn intermediate and small sized boulders, and a small wave will overturn small boulders. This is pretty straightforward, but what's that mean for the algae on each boulder? The small boulders overturned by most waves are disturbed frequently, so frequently that there just isn't enough time for the red algae to establish a foothold. What happens then is that the green algae dominates. For the large boulders, the opposite is true. Waves sufficiently strong to overturn them don't come along very often, and so the red algae have plenty of time to competitively exclude the green algae. But the intermediate sized boulders, which are the most interesting, allow both red and green algae to thrive. The middle sized boulders are disturbed at an intermediate rate. When a boulder is overturned, it's still first colonized by the green algae, but there's enough time between disturbance events for the red algae to also get a foothold. However, before the red algae can completely exclude the green algae, a wave comes along and overturns the boulder. When you have a beach with a lot of intermediate sized boulders, the idea goes as follows. First, a disturbance happens, emptying a boulder and allowing for colonization. Some of the green algae on a yet to be disturbed patch is able to escape the red algae in the form of sending its offspring, dispersing its spores to the newly available patch. Thus, in a sense, the green algae escapes in the form of reproduction before the red algae has the chance to capture it or competitively exclude it. It's quite a bit like the green algae are on the run, continually escaping their red captor, taking refuge on a freshly disturbed boulder, escaping at least in a transgenerational sense. With all of this in mind, we might imagine a beach that has a variety of boulders, small, large, and intermediate. Correspondingly, we might imagine waves vary in their size. Large waves overturn and disturb all the boulders. Between waves, algae disperse between boulders and competition occurs during which red algae kill off green algae. Intermediate waves overturn intermediate and small sized boulders and small waves overturn small boulders. As we established before, speedy green algae tend to dominate the small boulders and competitively superior red algae tend to dominate the larger boulders. Green and red algae coexist on the intermediate sized boulders. The intermediate disturbance level sets a middle ground in which neither strategy dominates, allowing for the maintenance of species diversity. This image is the platonic ideal of how the competition colonization trade off interacts with patch disturbance rate to shape the identity and potential for coexistence of competing species. While this cartoon is certainly an idealization and simplification, these qualitative patterns were observed by Sousa in 1979, the classic study I hinted at earlier. The hypothesis that species are more likely to coexist in areas of intermediate disturbance levels is very creatively titled the Intermediate Disturbance Hypothesis. Despite it being around for more than 50 years, ecologists are still locked in fierce debate about its merits. While people have interpreted intermediate disturbance in a number of ways, I personally believe it's most theoretically sound, when it's interpreted as striking a balance between speedy fugitives and strong competitors. Underlying this idea is that there must be some kind of physiological trade-off. In the context of the algae, this means that there must be some kind of evolutionary constraint that prevents you from both being a strong competitor and a strong colonizer at the same time. The early versus late colonizer dichotomy is very similar to the concept of ecological succession. So we're going to end this video here. We've gotten our feet a little bit wet, but frankly, we have quite a bit of ground to cover if we really want to get to the bottom of the competition and colonization trade-off. And in the next video, we're going to take it up a notch with some extremely exciting grass. You'll learn that next time you see a field of grass on a hike, it's not just some boring shades of green. No, it's an action scene with dozens of fugitives on the run, diving in each and every direction, avoiding capture with every disturbance. Or something like that. I might be overselling things just a tiny bit. I'm very passionate about ecology and things like competition between grass. You don't have to be. I hope you will be sometime soon. And I hope to show you why in the next video. Here we have the hero of our story, green algae. 